Good morning. Hope you're doing great. Hope you guys had a great Memorial Day. So today uh, I want to talk about chapters six and seven. And then we also have our midterm here at the end of the week. So let's go ahead and get going on this. Uh, chapter six is about creating offerings. And now we're going to get down to where we're starting to talk about what normally most of us think of in marketing. So what are we going to offer? So the offering is about the product that you're offering or the service that you're offering, what features it has, what benefits it's going to provide to the consumer, what price we're going to charge. And a, a term that we want to talk about a little bit that's very important to the consumer is the total cost of ownership. So the best way I can think of this is that, uh, let's say you buy a suit. Uh, you might pay $400 for the suit. But if that suit needs to be dry cleaned, and let's say you plan to have the suit for 10 years and dry clean it three times a year, well, there's 30 dry cleanings. If that's 10 bucks a piece, your suit really costs you $700 versus $400. And that's okay. People accept that. But as a marketer, when we're making that offer, we need to understand that the customer is probably thinking about that as well. So, that's one of the marketing appeals to no iron shirts, right? Because if you can throw that thing in the wash, the dryer, and it comes out wrinkle-free and you don't have to have it dry cleaned, you don't have dry cleaning costs, which substantially lowers the price of the shirt. So maybe you'd even pay more for these shirts because in the long run, it'll end up costing you less. Uh, if you buy a printer, okay, the, the printer's going to be, you know, $100. But how often do you need new cartridges? And some of you probably know this. You can get printers really cheap at Staples, maybe for 50 or 80 bucks. Then every time you want to go buy a new cartridge, it seems like, wow, these are 30, 35 bucks. Before you know it, you're in over your head on cartridges way more than the cost of the printer. And so there are a lot of products like that. Things that run on batteries, batteries are not cheap, right? So you may end up buying um, a fairly cheap item and then you just keep you know, buy no more batteries to keep it going. Or like um, a razor, um, you know, replacing it with the blades. It substantially increases the cost of the product. Okay, and uh, then as your text said, we have product-dominated offerings and we have service-dominated offerings. And that's basically just saying, uh, it, are people buying what you have more for the physical item of what it is? Or they buy it because of the service that you provide with the product. And sometimes it's a hybrid approach. So, for example, maybe if you want to buy a pair of sunglasses, that's more product dominated. Because once you buy the Oakleys or whatever you have, uh, there's really nothing that anybody does with them. Um, and um, maybe something more in the service uh, dominated Offering might be a repair shop for your car. So a lot of people would see a bunch of mechanics like, well, they kind of do the same thing, right? They change my oil, they, you know, fix my brakes. But sometimes what differentiates the offerings is what kind of service do you get? So when you take your car in, do they get it in on time? Is it done when they say it would be done? Do they have a really nice waiting room? Um, do you get donuts? Do they wash your car? Things like that. So sometimes those are the, the differentiators which will vault one company over the other. Uh, this kind of leads into this idea of the core product and what we call the augmented product. So in marketing, we talk about the core product. We're really focusing on the benefit of what a product provides to you and sort of what the product actually is. So I, actually, I'll go back to my example with the, the car mechanic uh, repair shop, or maybe a dealer uh, shop. Um, so the, the core product would be you take your car in and you are able to get it fixed or maintained. And that's what people think about when they go there. The augmented product would be all of the extras that they would provide to you. So again, the, the friendly service, um, you know, complimentary coffee and donuts, 
they might wash your car. Uh, they might do a, a f inspection complimentary just, you know, to provide good service. So many places will go ahead and um, change your brake pads or they'll change your oil uh, or they will um, rotate and balance your tires. And they'll charge you for those services. But what are some of the extra things that people provide to you? And again, is, is it a warranty um, or something like that? So those things all make a difference as well. Okay, so when most companies offer a product, they don't offer just a single product. They usually offer variations of that product. And the same thing with services too. If you go to a place for service, you usually can get different levels of service. You'll pay more for more services, but it gives people the options. And so that's a really smart thing we want to do in marketing because this helps us to expand our customer base and to satisfy more people because the premise is, is that not everybody wants the same thing, right? So if we talk about a product line, that is basically a group of you know, related products. And so the best example I think I can give you, which explains a lot of these terms, is think of the consumer product company Procter & Gamble. You may not really know how many Procter & Gamble products you buy, but it's one of the largest uh, companies out there providing lots of household and consumer goods. So Procter & Gamble is famous for uh, dishwashing detergent and toothpaste and diapers and laundry detergent and all sorts of things. And they have many brand names that you guys would be very familiar with. And so let's just take laundry detergent, for example. So they sell laundry detergent, but there's not just one kind, right? Um, and if they only offered one type of laundry detergent, people would buy it, but they all might not be very happy because people have different wants and different needs. And so actually, if we take a look into the laundry detergent, let's list some of the laundry detergents that Procter & Gamble provides. So you've probably heard of Tide. Okay, Tide is a kind of an all-purpose laundry detergent. A lot of people like to, to buy that. But Tide doesn't always work for everything. It works as a general detergent, but they also offer a brand called Draft. Now, many of us don't want to use Draft. Why? Because Draft is specializes its baby products. So it's washing out dirty cloth diapers and baby clothes. So the the makeup of this detergent is, you know, maybe it's gentler, it's softer, it has a different scent, and it works for babies. But most of us don't want to walk around with baby smelling clothes, right? Or we don't necessarily need detergents to get out, um, you know, stains and odors from a baby uh, because we have better hygiene than baby. Um, so the detergents have changed over the years, but uh, they had a detergent, I'm not even sure they offered anymore, but it was ERA, E-R-A, and it was, it was a stain fighter. And it was also one of the first laundry detergents that came out in liquid form. And then uh, they had Cheer. And Cheer was, it's, it really brightened a lot of the colors. Not that the others don't, but they put extra effort into helping that. So if brightening colors was important to you, then that's what you would want to buy. Or Gain. Gain was a, a very strong stain fighter. So grass stains in your blue jeans, gain's going to help get that out. And so it makes sense to have different offerings for different customers out there. And so some terms I want you to be familiar with are, number one, product mix. So when we talk about a pro company's product mix, we're talking about all the different products that they offer. So maybe it's 256 different items in their product mix. And then if we talk about product width, what we're talking about is the number of types of products. So for Procter & Gamble, you know, products that would count in their width might be laundry detergents, toothpaste, dish soap, um, diapers, and so on and so forth. And so each one of those would 
count as one in their product width. And then if we talked about product depth, that would be how many products in each of those categories. So if the depth on the toothpaste was nine, then you might have Crest toothpaste, you might have AIM toothpaste, and I'm going to run out of names, but all the different brands of toothpaste. And again, each toothpaste, while they clean your teeth, sometimes, uh, you know, one might be really good at fighting coffee stains or cigarette stains on your teeth. Another one might be uh, a fun kid's flavor um, and th those kind of things. So it makes sense, right, as to why these companies offer all of these different products. Um, and then this is just something that as, um, as companies are going forward, they want to think about, well, what's the right combination of products that we should have out there to help satisfy people in different target markets? Okay, great. Let's see. I think the one item I didn't really talk about was product extension. And so some of these terms kind of fall over each other a little bit. But the idea of product extension is taking a product and maybe modifying it to serve a little bit different need. So a good example of that would be like the Marriott hotels. So Marriott, when they first came out, just their Marriott hotel, right? And then they decided, wow, this is a nice hotel, but you know what? We probably have some clients that would like a little higher experience and they'd be willing to pay more for that. So then they create the Marriott suites. So you're not going to get in there for 150 bucks a night. It's going to cost you three or 400. But with that, you might get complimentary room service um, where they will shine your shoes and put extra bathrobes in, in your room and all sorts of things. And then uh, Marriott also decided to aim towards um, maybe a more economically minded customer. So then they created the Marriott Courtyard and the Marriott Fairfield. Still nice Marriott hotels, but if you go to a Fairfield, you aren't going to have a, a full service restaurant, uh, you'll get a complimentary continental breakfast in the morning, um, you know, with probably some, you know, donuts and coffee and juice, and maybe they'll put some eggs out there for you, but it'll be self-serve and things like that. So different clients want different things and they're willing to pay at different price points. But by ex extending their product up and down, they're able to serve a lot bigger market and make money in a lot of different areas. And then they even went the route of like the business traveler. So uh, Marriott, the residence in, even in the name, you can kind of see what they're aiming at there. This is where instead of going staying in a hotel for one or two nights, you might be working for a company and you're on a three week assignment. So these residence inns, if you've ever stayed in one, it's more like a little apartment. You know, the closets are a little bit bigger. They have workspace for you. The bedroom might be set off from kind of a workroom and maybe even a little kitchenette, um, which those things probably wouldn't be valued if you were just staying for the weekend. But if you're there for two or three weeks and you need to bring more stuff and lay it all out and have a place to work, that fits the bill. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's talk about some of the, if we're to break products down into different types of goods or types of products, there are four categories that we should cover. The first is convenience goods. The second is shopping goods. The third is specialty goods. And the fourth are unsought goods. So convenience good, as the name suggests, is probably something that you don't pay a lot for, but you might need it pretty often or you might need it pretty quick. And so you want it, but it's not super important to you. Um, as to maybe the quality of the item or where you get it or, you know, if you're paying a little bit more for it. Um, so the thing to think about here are just what are items that uh, we might just, you know, quickly want to pick up and we don't give much thought about it beforehand. So think of items in a convenience store, right? So if you go to a Quick Star or Casey's or something like that, you pick up a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread or you want to stop in and get a soda or a cup of coffee, um, you know, or a donut or things like that. Um, or maybe uh, I need a razor or uh, some shampoo. Um, 
So these types of products, pretty low cost. Um, some people have loyalties to certain brands, but a lot of times people just want to go get something. So a convenience good, we're going to have in convenient locations for people. They're going to be in department stores. They're going to be in grocery stores. They're going to be a gas station, uh, convenience stores and things like that. And sometimes we'll even pay a little bit more just because it's convenient, right? So maybe your gallon of milk instead of maybe it's $3 at the grocery store, it might be $4 at the convenience store. You don't care. It's midnight. The grocery store is not open. You know you can go there and get this or a bag of ice or something like that. The shopping goods are goods that we're probably going to pay a little bit more for. And we care a little bit more about style and brand. And we're going to shop around for these things. We might go to two or three different stores and compare before making our purchase decision. So something like this might be like a dryer and a washer. Uh, if you need a new washer and dryer, you probably aren't just going to go to the first store and, oh, that's good, I'll buy it. You'll go look, and then you might look at, you might go to Lowe's, you might go to Menards, you might go to an appliance store, and, you know, wherever else. And you might talk to some people, and you kind of think about it, you might do a little bit of internet research. And after doing a little bit of comparison, then you're going to go ahead and make the purchase. Sometimes for clothes, if you you want to buy a new suit for work, um, some people may just go in, take something off the rack and go. Other people, again, might go to a few stores, look around. You know, a suit might be a, you know, three, four, five, six hundred dollar investment. And if you don't just, uh, you know, have that money easily, and that's a lot of money, uh, you want to think about how you spend it. So you do a little bit of looking. And a little bit more comparison. Okay, so the third item is a specialty item, sometimes called a luxury good. And these are items where probably more expensive, um, probably something that we just enjoy and we want. And because of that, um, we're, we might be pretty brand loyal. Uh, it's really important to us to have the right thing that makes us feel good, either from a social standing standpoint uh, situation or just, you know, I feel good that I have this and I want this. So on the one extreme, a specialty item might be a Rolex watch or, you know, a Corvette or something like that. So sometimes those things, you're going to go to a, a standalone store. You may go a long ways to go get something because this is a big deal. And I'm happy that that's part of the experience. If I have to fly to New York to go to some famous, you know, fashion store so that I can get this kind of um, clothing article, I'll do it because it's a specialty item and I really want that. So there are people, obviously, who buy those kind of things. Um, it's changed a little bit, but in the car market, uh, the Lexus dealerships sort of falls into this mode. So if you want to buy well, a Ford pickup truck, you could probably go to, gee, 50 different places, 100, or 150 different places in the state of Iowa and find that Ford truck. If you want to buy a Lexus, and I think this is still the case, I think there are probably only three places in Iowa you can get them, or it used to be. That would be Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and Davenport. Uh, maybe since it's expanded. But um, now if you don't live in those three cities and you want a Lexus, you're in Dubuque, guess what? You need to drive down to Davenport or drive over Sea Rapids to buy one. But for people who want a Lexus, they're going to do it because it's that important to them. And then the unsought good. Wow, this is a tough one to market. So these are goods and products that people don't want to buy. They're not looking to buy those. Now, they will buy them, but they're not super excited about it. So guess what falls into that? Things like a funeral home, you know, planning your uh, your gravestone or, or your funeral service or life insurance or just insurance in general. These items generally aren't fun to buy because... Um, you know, a lot of times it, it signifies something bad's going to happen to you. We don't like to think about that. 
Now, do we buy insurance? Of course we buy insurance. We want to protect our our family, uh, people that we care about, uh, want to just protect our assets. You know, you have home insurance in case your house burns down. You still have to pay the mortgage, and now you have no place to live. So, of course, we need to have insurance. Um, automobile insurance, that's no fun to buy, is it? But if you get in a big accident and you have $20,000 worth of damage to your car, aren't you glad you have insurance? Yeah. So, um, anyway, so these are kind of items where people aren't excited about buying, but you, if you're in that business, you know people need the product, and they're going to be in hurting probably if they don't have it and something bad happens to them. So we have to market these things in different ways. Um, kind of hard to get your customer excited about buying something that they don't want, uh, even though they know they need to have it. You know, and insurance is a, a great example. Let's just look at auto insurance. So, all right, so I'm supposed to pay $2,000 a year, and I hope I don't get in an accident. Well, if you don't get in an accident, that's great. But then you feel like you just, $2,000, you just wash down the drain. Well, yeah, but again, why we do that is because if something bad happens, the insurance is there to cover us. So there are different ways to market these products. Um, you have to make different kinds of appeals. You have to try and, uh, you know, um, appeal to the person's mood when they're buying this. So for, let, let's run back through the four of them. So a convenience item. Okay, I don't think about this a lot. I don't care about it a lot. So how am I going to attract that customer, right? So you, you, you have to make it convenient. Uh, probably are not going to go into great depth about the product quality and all of its features. You're just going to have to, you know, hit them at the right time with a quick, exciting message that makes them say, yeah, I want to go get that. A shopping good. Now people are starting to discern a little bit more. So you better give them some good comparative information why they should pick brand B over brand A or C. A specialty item, that one uh, probably just sort of stands in a its own. If you have a great brand reputation, people will want to come running to you. So your task is how do you create that aura? And then how do you let people know and keep reminding them that it's there? And then they will probably come to you. And then the unsought good, um, you have to hit people where they're, they're motivated. Um, so it seems like a little bit of doom and gloom, but a lot of times with the, you know, the insurance, uh, what you try to show people is, Hey, if something bad happens to you, and it happens, bad happens to everybody, right? Do you want to be in this situation? Well, gee, of course not. Okay, we can help you with peace of mind and with happiness and to not feel crummy when you get in trouble. And so those tend to be pretty effective ways there. Okay, so um, a lot of our course is spent on what the B2C, business to consumer, uh, marketing, but as we talked about, I think it was in chapter four, B two B marketing. It's good to come back and revisit that as well because it's such a big market, and many of you will go into B two B type of business. So when we look at the different types of B two B products, we have different categories. So here's some terms that you may not have heard before; they're not super commonly talked about. But in B two B marketing. Some of our products are capital equipment. So capital equipment basically is some kind of machine that probably lasts more than a year. That sort of feeds the definition of that. Uh, we also have raw materials. You now you and I probably don't go to the store and you know buy a barrel of oil, but uh, a lot of businesses you know they need fuel. Uh, they might need that barrel of oil to lubricate their machines in their production processes. Um, uh, you and I probably aren't buying, you know, tons of salt and sand. Uh, but there are a lot of businesses who do need to buy that in bulk. Um, so you got capital equipment, you got raw materials, you have OEM products, and those are original and manufacture. And so these are products, basically they're manufactured goods. And uh, in B2B, a lot of times we will buy those things. Um, to help us um, uh, in making what our product is. Uh, you also have MRO products, which is maintenance, repair, and operation type products. 
So these are some products that a business needs to keep functioning. So like janitorial services, I, again, as individuals, go, what? You know, I clean my own house. Well, business doesn't. I mean, businesses will hire a janitorial service to come in and clean the restrooms and change all the paper towel stations and things like that. It's not really part of the product that they're offering, but as a place of business, you need to have this, right? Uh, then we also have facilitated uh, products or purchases. And so these are just a lot of the extra services that businesses need to keep running. So whether you're buying marketing research services or uh, insurance or you're contracting with a copier company to keep your copy machines going or working with bankers on uh, lines of credit and things like that. So um, not directly related to the product that you're producing, but you have to have those things in order to do your business. Okay, I want to spend a little time talking about brand. Everybody's heard of brand. So this part here is we're talking about the logos, the brand name, trademarks, and those types of things. And just as much as we want to talk about the product itself, so like, you know, here's my product. It's my cell phone. Uh, the brand, well, this one, actually, this is a, an, a Samsung uh, Android, okay? I don't have an iPhone. Um, but the, the brand Samsung is really important. The brand Apple is really important. Um, what brands do for us is it gives us confidence because we have faith in a brand name that they'll back, we we perceive a certain level of quality with a brand. Uh, if uh, certain brands, if they go bad, the company will stand behind those because that's part of their reputation. So companies invest a lot in their brand. They'll advertise their brand. They'll promote their brand. And as consumers, good brand names will give us confidence. It will help us trust the company. It will help. Uh, we, we think about, oh, I, I need a new mobile phone. I should go to the Apple store because they have great ones. And so it's a great marketing tool as well. Just it kind of puts your product or name in top of mind with people. So this is why companies pour a lot of time, effort and money in building their brand. And sometimes that's the differentiator. Quite often the products perform the same type of function, but the brand might give it a better reputation or just make people feel better about it. Um, so it, it's really, really important. And if you look, um, you could Google this, like top 20 brand names. Some of the names you'll find in there would be Microsoft, Google, Amazon, um, AT&T. So when you think about famous companies, they all have a, an intangible asset, and it's called good goodwill. And that's really tied back to their brand name. So, you know, the name McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Google, Microsoft, regardless of what they're doing and providing, that name is worth billions of dollars. If they, if Coca-Cola was willing to sell their name and you were to buy that name and then you could use that name, you would pay, well, you and I don't have the money for it, but uh, investors out there would pay billions of dollars for that because you have a clientele, you have an image, and all of that is really, really important. And um, so it's not enough just to have a good quality product or a good quality service. You also want to have a great reputation and a great following, and brands will help you do that. So sort of like we talked about with uh, product extensions and product lines, we can now employ branding to do some of those same things. So if we're going to talk about brand extension, so let's let's go back and look at our company, Apple. Okay, so Apple at one time, you know, well, they still do, but Apple uh, has the, um, had their MacBook. Okay, great. That's what we're known for. Well, guess what? Apple decided to extend their brand and get into the cell phone market. So they started making iPhones and then they made iPods and then they made iPads. 
And all of these things in the iCloud, what do they all have in common? They're all Apple products. And if it's a new product that you, um, new product to you, you're more likely to try it because it's an Apple. You trust the Apple brand. You trust they know what they're doing, even if they haven't done something before in that product area. So that's where it's really powerful. A lot of companies will partner up with each other and they will co-brand. So let's see, I think, uh, what are the companies? You know, Hershey's Chocolate, they, they've done this before where like Hershey's uh, will offer a product with, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now, but you know, for example, maybe it's Hershey's and Nestle's will get together and then they will make a chocolate something. Uh, oh, um, I think is um, maybe it was Hershey's and Jello got together for like, you know, maybe Hershey or uh, Hershey's Jello pudding pops, those kind of things. You, you, you bring two companies together where there's a, the connection sort of makes sense where you can partner and you can draw on both brand popularities and both clientels and they'll sort of come together. So that's a strategy that we use sometimes in marketing. Um, this item was talked about under branding, but it doesn't have to be branding. It could just be products, but the term cannibalization. Okay. So that word means you eat someone, other person. Okay. That's not what we're talking about marketing, but in a way, when marketers offer new products, one of their concerns is, is it cannibalizing or eating away market share at existing products? So, for example, if, you know, the Ford has the F-150 truck, well, if they come out with the F-850, which maybe they already have, uh, that's great. Maybe that will attract new clients. But a question that they'll always want to ask themselves is, all right, uh, we're selling 10 million 150s. We expect that we roll out the 850. We'll sell 10 million more of those. Now, as long as there, are, as we keep the 10 million 150s and the 10 million 850s, we got 20 million cars or trucks. But if by rolling out and selling 10 million 850s, that sort of causes half of the 150 buyers to move to the 850, we cannibalize half of that product. So now we're only selling 5 million 150s and 10 million 850s. So now we're selling 15 million trucks, which is fine. That's still pretty good. But just don't want to recognize that all 10 million of the, the new sales uh, were new because really you stole some of your customers from your existing products. And so anytime we roll out a new product, we expect some cannibalization. There's nothing wrong with that. However, if you... Uh, cannibalize too much of the existing product, maybe it wasn't worth the time and effort and cost of rolling out the new product. So that's just something that we try to take a look at. Okay, uh, let's talk for a moment about packaging and labeling. So these are, you know, a, a very important part of marketing. How something is packaged might be the reason why you buy it. And it's kind of cool because there have been a lot of innovations in packaging. Um, whether it's uh, you know the no leak tops or think about uh, when I was a kid, um, you would drink soda either in a can, and they'd actually have a tab where you, you pulled it off, but then you had a tab and you it, you just threw it away because it came off the can. Or bottles, you'd have to actually use you know, a bottle opener, which you guys have probably not seen that on a soda in your lifetime. That used to be the only way they would serve soda. So you'd, you'd, you know, kind of like a bottle of beer where you'd snap the cap off. Well, that's how you'd do it with the pop, right? So um, over time, what has happened, of course, and, and bottles uh, always used to be metal cans and uh, glass bottles. Well, packaging has changed over the years, hasn't it? So one, now we have different sizes, you know, you, six ounce can of pop used to only be 12 ounce cans. Um so they change the sizes. Um, the cans now, when you, you pop them open, the little tab just stays on the can, unless you want to tear it off, but you don't have to. Uh, the bottles now are all screw top and they're plastic. Um, so we really don't do 
open bottles with, you know, the caps that come off because we want to reseal them. So that's great that we have, you know, packages improved a lot. Toothpaste caps used to come with a cap unscrewed and then people would drop them down their sink and it clogged their drains. Now you generally either have the, the pump or just a little pop top where the, the cap doesn't really come off uh, the tube, which is even better. So, um, you know, it, and you think about why you would buy certain products. Sometimes it's quality of the product. Sometimes you buy it because of the packaging. Think of how many little convenient things we have now. You can, you can bring soup to work and you don't have to have a bowl and a spoon. Uh, you just bring your little microwave package, uh, stick in the microwave. There's a spoon on top. You eat it, then you throw it away. That's very convenient for people. And so packaging is important. Um, packaging also protects your product. Um, we can market with packaging by having a really cool shape or a cool color, um, you know, words on there um, to grab people's attention. And then labeling, of course, uh, sometimes it's regulatory. The government says, hey, you got to say what the ingredients are in this thing. Um, and a lot of times we want to get people information. It's fortified with vitamins. It's, you know, um, uh, environmentally friendly, those type of things. So packaging and labeling and branding, those types of things oftentimes are even more important than actually the content of the product. And the competition out there is so good these days that so many companies really are giving you very similar products in terms of function. And what differentiates the popular ones from the other ones, it's marketing, it's branding, it's packaging, it's labeling, and it's things like that. Okay. So let's see. Um, Let's talk about who manages uh, the process in all of this. So in marketing, a common position is someone called the brand manager. And there are a lot of different things going on in business, but many companies, you put a person in charge of the brand. So if the brand is Skippy Peanut Butter, person in charge of that, looks you know, they're communicating with the people who are producing it, the people who are marketing it, the people who are packaging it, um, the, the distributors, the suppliers, anything that has to do with Skippy peanut butter, the brand manager is on it. And so they're not really a specialist in all of the functions, but they're a specialist in the Skippy peanut butter brand. Um, brand manager, product manager, very similar. Uh, sometimes we put a manager in charge of a market or a territory. So they would be in charge of all of the things that are sold in the state of Missouri or in the country of Denmark. And so that's another way that we can organize as well. Um, okay, so I was going to go roll right into chapter seven, but I think just I'm going to run to another video just in case uh, this one gets too long. Uh, we're already pretty long at 38 minutes. So I'm going to cut out here and produce another one for chapter seven. Um, talking about new products and new offerings.